morning, church, so you should have those Bibles open by now to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Um, we're going to pick up from verse number 1. Uh, last week we discovered that there is a right way and a wrong way to come to worship. And so as we gather together, we ought to pay attention to God, watch our steps when we enter into the house of God, listen to the Word of God so that we might rightly respond to the truth of His Word. And so the preacher is concerned not only with how to listen, but he's also concerned with what we say. And so his first exhortation, which we covered last week, was the exhortation to listen up. In verse number one, he said, guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen, rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. And then we get to the second exhortation. His second exhortation, which pertains primarily to prayer, is for us to watch what we say. Look at verse number 2. It says, Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So in order to fully understand the significance of verse number 2, we must understand the context in which this verse is found. This verse has a very specific context and a very specific application. This is not a general urging for people to be careful and selective with the usage of their words. Uh, this is not the, the same as being uh, quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, don't get me wrong, those things are true. Right? Uh, as believers, we ought to be careful and selective with the words that we use. As believers, we ought to be quick to listen and slow to speak. But those truths are taught elsewhere in Scripture. That's not the point of the text in Ecclesiastes 5, verse number 2. We find that truth expressed elsewhere. Like I said, in places like Proverbs Chapter 10, verse number 19, it says, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Or other places like Proverbs 18, verse number 21, tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Our Lord himself said in Matthew chapter 12, he says, But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Our, our, our Lord's brother James writes in James chapter 1, verse number 19, he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Then a few verses later, in verse number 26, he says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. And so, while it's true that we must be selective and careful with the words that we use, while it's true uh, that we ought to be quick to listen and slow to speak, those truths are taught to us elsewhere in Scripture. That's not what the preacher is saying in chapter 5. In our text, he's applying this exhortation to a very specific issue. He's giving us warning about us being careless in our prayer life. Go back to verse 2. It says, do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. That's our prayer life. To bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven, you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Prayer is a serious matter. It is a tremendous privilege that we are able 
to approach the throne of God's grace at any time and from any place. And as we do so, we must do so in a manner that honors our Father. There's a right way to approach the throne of God's grace. Last week I said something at the end of the message in thinking about this text this morning, and that was to encourage you to think about it like this. Imagine that you and I were privileged to bring our needs or to bring our request directly to the Oval Office for presidential consideration. I would imagine that if we were extended that opportunity, that we would be careful to prepare our words, careful to present our needs in, in a way that honors and the one that's receiving them. That we would be careful as we entered into the uh, Oval Office that we would behave appropriately. If that's the case, then how much more important it is when we enter into the throne of God's grace. Yet there is so much superficial praying that happens among the body of Christ. From, from those who seem to, to know little or nothing about the fear of God. Question for us to Consider just from the very get-go of the message is, is this. Do we really mean what we say when we stand and worship in the house of God? Even up to this point, in the songs that we sang together, did, did we give thought to the words that were coming out of our mouths and, and did we sing as an appropriate uh, response or reflection of who we are it, it can be so easy for us to to read a psalm or to sing a hymn without us ever thinking about what it means which means if we're honest sometimes our reading and our singing is simply empty and meaningless. Sadly, sometimes our prayers can be prayerless. Simply uh, repeating pious words does not mean that those words come from a pious heart. John Bunyan once wrote these words about prayer. He said, in prayer, it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. So verse 3 kind of presents us an analogy of what he's trying to teach us. He says in verse number 3, For the dream comes through much effort, and the voice of a fool through many words. And so just as many dreams shows that the person who's sleeping is a hard worker, so too many words show that the one that is praying is a fool. And that's what he's saying. And so before you begin to think, man, that's harsh. I can't believe the preacher goes there. May you understand that he's not the only one in the scriptures to go there. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus himself says these words from verse 5 to verse number 8. Jesus says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room. Close your door. And pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now that's a beautiful truth. 
a truth that Charles Spurgeon himself understood and embraced. He said, in, in respect to prayer, Spurgeon said, it's not the length of our prayers, but the strength of our prayers. That, and that makes all the difference. And so uh, he gives us these uh, exhortations in chapter 5 and verse number 1. The preacher starts off and he exhorts us to, to listen up and to enter the house of God in a right manner. And, and, and then the second exhortation from verses 2 and 3 is that we are to watch what we say, give thoughtful consideration in how we pray and how we present our needs and requests before the throne of God's grace. Then he gets to this third exhortation from verses 4 through 7. And in it, he encourages us to fulfill our vows. To be a people of integrity. Look at verse 4. It says, When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for He takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. So after telling us to, to listen up and after telling us to watch what we say, the preacher now tells us what to do. In other words, he says that we are to do what we say. Or, or to be more precise, we're to pay what we vow. And so we need to understand the concept of making vows unto God. You see, in the Old Testament and throughout the Old Testament, vows were entirely a voluntary act of worship. God didn't demand the making of vows. But He freely received a vow when it was made. Sometimes vows were, were made to dedicate costly objects such as homes, land, even people. We see examples of this type of vow in Leviticus chapter 27. Sometimes vows were, were made to abstain from a blessing from God. Uh, sometimes vows were made to abstain from things like wine or strong drink, grapes and raisins. We, we see this type of vow in Numbers chapter 6. Sometimes vows were, were made in response to God's deliverance. And Jonah gives us a perfect example of this type of vow in Jonah chapter 2. And sometimes vows were made conditionally. Vows were made asking God to intervene in some extraordinary way. Perhaps one of the most powerful examples of this type of vow is given to us from Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter one. Now, since vows are not required by believers, but are absolutely binding once they've been made, one must be very careful when making a vow or a promise unto God. I want you to listen clearly to an example of, of how uh, these vows worked. I'm going to read to you a portion from Numbers chapter 21. It's only two verses. But here we see how vows clearly work. In Numbers chapter 21, in verses 2 and 3, it says this. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. You see, the, uh, if you'll do this, then I'll do something in response. That's, that's, that's the vow, right? Then it says in verse number 3, The Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. Then they utterly destroyed them and their cities. Thus the name of the place was called Hormah. And so uh, there's the picture. That, that's how vows work. So, so God did not require His people to make vows in order to be accepted by him. But the opportunity was there for individual to make a vow to express their dedication or their commitment to God if they felt led to 
do so. But there were requirements that needed to be upheld. There, there was an understanding that one needed to have before they uttered that vow from their mouths. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, we're told in verses 21 through 23, where it says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For it will be a sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. In other words, if you're going to make a commitment to God, then honor it. Because if you make a commitment and you fail to honor it, that's sin. And then he goes on to say, however, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be a sin in you. You should be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. And so it's better to not vow and walk in obedience than to vow and walk in disobedience to that vow. It is in light of, of, of this that, that the preacher urges complete and prompt fulfillment of one's vow, promise, or commitment that was made unto God. Which is a good time for us to, to pause, reflect upon that, and wonder how many idle promises, commitments, have we made unto God out of sheer desperation in the heat of the moment. God, if you'll just do this, then I promise you I'll do that. And, and then how many of those promises have you fulfilled? It's much easier to make a promise than it is to keep a promise. And yet people do this all the time with God. Another way to say all of this is simply to encourage us not to play games and try to manipulate God in order to do something on our behalf. If you promise him something, then be a person of integrity and fulfill what it is that you've promised. It's better to not make a vow and to strive to walk in obedience than it is to make a vow and, and walk in disobedience by failing to keep what it is that you promised him. I mean, you understand that vowing and paying cannot be separated. They always go together. Psalm chapter 76, verse number 11, it begins with these words. It says, Make vows to the Lord your God and... Fulfill them. If you're going to make the vow, then honor it. Fulfill it. And so in verse number 6, uh, the preacher anticipates that there's going to be some pushback on this. Uh, there might be an excuse that, that is going to be offered for the failing to fulfill one's vow. And so he addresses that in verse number 6. Verse 6 says, Do not let your speech cause you to sin. Do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? In other words, when, when the priestly messenger of God arrives to take claim, whatever it was that was dedicated unto God, committed unto him, a person might have second thoughts and that person might then object and, and say that their vow was and that was a mistake. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. In response to this, the, the preacher gives a very strong warning, right? Saying that the Lord will express his anger against such antics. He will express his anger and will bring about his judgment. And when we fail to follow through on what we say, especially on what we promise and commit unto God, and the Bible says that we're guilty of sin. It's wrong. It's not minor. It's not insignificant. It, it's major. It matters. And so if we're guilty of failing to 
to follow through on our vows and promises unto God, and we haven't honored that, it's sin. And because it's sin, then we need to repent from that. We need to confess and, and repent and, and humbly stand in awe of the one who knows all about our empty promises and empty vows. And the only way that we can appropriately approach the throne of God's grace is through His Son. He is the only means by which we have access unto the Father. It is through Jesus. And so we're separated from God because of our sin. But Jesus was the perfect priest who, who gave the, the perfect sacrifice. And only Jesus can cleanse us and reconcile us unto the Father. And so our only hope is to cast ourselves upon the mercy of God through Jesus Christ, His Son. We repent from our sins of commission and our sins of omission, which simply means that we repent from the wrong that we do and the right things that we fail to do. When we repent, when we confess that, we ask for God's cleansing from that, and it's only then that we're able to receive His forgiveness through His Son, Jesus, who's the only one that has ever kept all of His promises unto God. It is by the mercy of Jesus that we are forgiven of our failures. It is by the grace of our Lord that, that we have the help in, in keeping our commitments unto God. It's only by Jesus. And so the, the, the section is going to close with a description of the heart attitude that we ought to have and that we ought to bring unto everything that we say and do in worship. And that's why he concludes in verse number 7. He says, For in many dreams... And in many words, there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Well, this verse is powerful and profound because it brings together two great themes of this great book. From the very beginning, Ecclesiastes started with the phrase, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Preacher was addressing the futility of life in a fallen world. And here we see such vanity and idle daydreaming. And we see that vanity in foolish words. And he's talking about the daydreaming and the foolish words of a churchgoer who only pretends to worship. They're going through the motions without ever fully and truly offering their heart and their mind unto God. And their worship is more about themselves than it is about our Father. May you know that the fear of God is the ultimate safeguard against false and insincere worship. When we enter into the house of the Lord. When we come together, even whether that's entering into God's presence in public like now, or in private as you go into that space to, to enter that time of prayer with our Father. Either way, in public or in private, the fear of God is the ultimate safeguard about insincere and false worship. It's not trivial. How we worship matters. So as we come together to go before the throne of God's grace, it is time that we do that with the fear of the Lord. It is time to, to recognize just how excellent and great He is. It is time to Exalt the name of God above all names. 
It is time to acknowledge God's power in His sovereignty in and through all things that we face in this world. It is time that we humble ourselves before the throne of God's grace, standing in awe of His presence, glorifying His his sovereign rule and reign over all things in every one. Having the fear of the Lord is important. It should be a priority in our lives. When we have the fear of God, then then we will come to worship with expectancy and awe. When we fear the Lord, we will be ready to listen to God. He has something to say. He has something to say to each and every one of us. And when we fear the Lord, then we'll come with ears wide open, ready to hear what God's going to say to us through the teaching of the Word, through the preaching of the Word, through the singing of God's Word, through the proclamation of His truth. When we fear the Lord, we'll come ready to hear, but not just to hear, to rightly respond to what it is that we've received from His Word. When we have the fear of the Lord, oh, then we'll be very careful in what we say and how we pray. But when we fear God, we will give God exactly what he deserves. And that's total obedience in all things. When we fear God, we will not withhold from God our service and obedience unto him. We will strive to walk in obedience to the will of God and to the word of God. And so, having a proper fear of God means that we understand that He is sovereign, He is holy, He is perfectly pure and righteous. We have no right to approach Him other than the right that He extends to His children because of their faith in His Son, who now takes the perfect righteousness of Jesus and credits it to our account because of our faith in the Son. And now we have the right, the ability, the opportunity to approach our Heavenly Father at any time, in any place. And may we do so much more faithfully, much more consistently in our lives. And as we gather together, may we come with an urgency expecting to hear and receive something from God's Word. And then we get that, then it needs to be matched with a commitment from us. What are we going to do? What what decision are we going to to make in light of what we heard from, from God and His Word today? And so that's what we end our service with today an opportunity to respond to the Word of God. My encouragement to you is to give prayerful consideration to asking God, what does He want from you? For some of you, He wants a a relationship. He wants you to repent, confess, and believe in Jesus Christ and receive the salvation that is offered only through His Son. For others, He wants a deeper commitment. He, He wants you to honor the promises that you've already made to him. He wants you to acknowledge that and walk in a faithful obedience unto him. For all of us, God wants us to love him and to love one another, to serve him, and to serve one another. May we do that together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you through
the journey through Ecclesiastes, Father, and we have so much more to go and so much more to learn and understand. And so, Father, help us in this. Father, as we reflect upon your word in this moment, may your spirit move among us. May each and every one of us not worry about what other people are thinking or what other people are doing, but may we all rightfully reflect upon your word and figure out what it is that we need to do and how we need to respond today. And help us to love you and to honor you in all things. Be glorified. We continue to worship. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.